Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I open uh, our meeting. The language of the meeting today will be in the English language, and it will take place at the request of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs of the Dutch House of Representatives. This is a public meeting, and hereby I want to welcome our guests, Mr. Paul van Hoofd, Senior Strategic Analyst at HCSS and Chair of the HCSS Initiative on the Future of Transatlantic Relations. Also welcome to Mrs. Uh, Roberta Haar, Professor of Foreign Policy Analysis and Transatlantic Relations at the University of Maastricht, and Mr. Jaap Verhul, Extraordinary Professor Transatlantic Relations at the Radboud University. I welcome also the members of the Dutch House of Representatives. Um, two of them had to uh, cancel their participation because of urgent reasons, so unfortunately they cannot be here. But we do welcome Mr. Brekelmans, VVD, and Mr. van der Lee, uh, GroenLinks. Uh, my name is Raymond de Roon, and I represent the Party for Freedom. Also, I welcome uh, anyone on the public gallery. Well, there is no one at this moment, um, but perhaps people are following this meeting at home, and I welcome them as well. I suggest that each speaker um, takes about five minutes for an opening statement, uh, and then after we had heard uh, the three speakers, um, uh, I would like to spend the rest of the time for questions and, uh, of the members of parliament and uh, a debate, if possible. Mr. Van Hoofd, I would like to give you the floor now and ask you to use the microphone. All right. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, so the midterms, I think there's a, there's a few things we can say about this, um, and a, f a few things that are still big black boxes, as in there's a lot of, there will continue to be a lot of uncertainty about this. So I would say that the results of the midterm from a, from a European, from a Dutch perspective, are good. Um, and when I say this, I don't mean, you know, regardless of whatever one's personal political preferences are, um, the, this version of the Democratic Party is more interested in cooperating with European allies than this version of the Republican Party. Um, right? So, and I'll go a little bit further into into that, but so on the whole, the, the results of the election, which would have either have seemed to, to have been a resounding victory for the, could have been, was predicted to be a red wave, which would have been a resounding victory for the Trump-like uh, Republican Party, uh, Trump-supported Republican candidates, uh, turned out to be actually something that was very, very much counter to the historical trend, which was even uh, small losses in Congress and actually uh, gains in the Senate for the Democrats, which is for the incumbent party, which is unusual. So that does, at least at one level, that can be interpreted as a rejection of, Repo of Trump-like Republican Party politics by the voters. Um, and I'm saying that not, you know, regardless of political, per personal political preferences, the Trump presidency was to put it mildly, rather problematic when it came to allies, both in Europe and in Asia. I apologize for my voice, I, it's getting over a cold. <clears throat> so that being said, and, and wh where it's also good is that there, doesn't, there, there will not be a paralysis within the Senate, so it's still possible to, to have some momentum, some forward momentum uh, for the administration, which in general, whoever was in charge is a good thing, I think given the amount of crises happening simultaneously in Europe, in Asia, uh, potential crises in Asia, and uh, still very much potential crises in the Middle East. So in this sense, this is all relatively good news. Um, what the results, if you look at them, also show is that some of these candidates that were fielded by the Republican Party were particularly bad, and still the margins of victory and bad, again, I think in a relatively objective manner. And still the, the margins of victory were pretty small for the Democrats. Um, and I think it also shows that the Republican Party, which is still, you know, which has historically been a very consi a, a political party, again, regardless of per personal preferences, which a, a party which has been very good and consistent on foreign policy, at least since, you know, the, the, the aftermath of World War II. 
And that party is in bad shape. It's, it's been taken over by the fringe. Um, the, it, it is, the, the party has not rejected. So f it now seems in the process of rejecting Trump-like politics. Trump being Trump-like meaning this this constant polarization, this very co toxic atmosphere, this you know dragging in conspiracy theories, accusing political adversaries, discounting the whole political process. It's it's the whole party it seems to have gone in that direction, and maybe the poor results will change it. But that is still I think a big big question mark, and the Republican Party, which historically has been good on foreign policy, has now become much less so. Um, so what does that what does this mean for actual policy uh, issues? Um, I think we won't see any changes uh, on China. The China policy is the one thing I think in this highly polarized this this high, highly toxic political environment is the one thing that uh, Republicans and Democrats have agreed upon for the last few years, and I think they will continue to agree on. When it came to, to Russia, I think there were a few of the, the, the candidates that, if they would have won, would have tried to, if not stop U.S. aid to Russia, would certainly have tried to put in a lot more, um, put in a lot more questions on the amount of funding that should go to aid to, to Ukraine, and certainly would have muddled the waters and kind of impacted the coherence of, of the Biden administration's foreign policy. Um, I think it will be difficult, given the distribution of, of Congress right now, is to pass meaningful tech technology legislation. I think that will be more difficult. There seems to be both agree in a sense of, of trying to hamper China's growth and access to technology. However, the manner in which seems to vary quite a bit from the, seems to vary at least to a large extent from the Republican and Democratic side. <laughs> Now, there's also, I think, larger trends that are still going on. Uh, if you look at just recent opinion polling, um, there's a 40% uh, of the U.S. public um, thinks that the U.S. has too many military commitments. It is too involved in military conflicts. 30% uh, seems to be even about it, and 20% would, enc would encourage more involvement. But I think the trend unlike what the political the parties in, in power generally do, the trend is very much against that. And why I think that matters is because we, what we do see with this Congress, which I think has the largest or one of the largest waves of fairly young politicians, members, in, in a very long time, is that younger generations, whichever side of the political aisle they sit on, have less affinity with Europe specifically. <coughs> right? There's, we had a in the first part of the 20th century, there were multiple waves of migrants. Uh, most of Americans were, you know, Irish hyphen Americans, German hyphen, whatever. A lot of hyphen Americans. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of identification or kind of interest even in Europe has, has declined quite a bit over the last 30 years. And, and you can t tell that by, you can tell from the members of mm -hmm. The Senate Foreign Relations Committees and so on. So, you know, the, the the John McCain's, the Joe Bidens are kind of a last of a certain breed, and I think that's that's something we should also keep paying attention to. Um, and it's hard to know exactly how to interpret the results. Is this simply because there's an cumulative effect of all the scandals surrounding Trump and the candidates he preferred? Is it a desire for stability? I'm not sure. I think that's still a big open question mark, and judging by a lot of opinion polls, judging by still very enthusiastic support for uh, not Trump, may, maybe not so much for Trump himself, but Trump 2.0, like candidates like like uh, DeSantis, I think this is still a long-term structural trend we should keep paying attention to. Um, I hope that covers a lot of the, the big ground. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Hooft. Then I'll give the floor to Miss. Hi, Mrs. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. And I apologize that um, my Dutch is not better, that I couldn't articulate these ideas in, in, in Dutch. But I have uh, provided a position paper for you, and I will draw my remarks from the position paper. It is also drawn from an article that I wrote for Atlantic Perspective that was due on the 18th of November that will come out um, shortly, I guess. 
But it was very clear to me in the fall that the, these midterm elections were exceedingly consequential or there was very much interest here in the Netherlands for these elections, more so than other, uh, other midterms that, since that I have been here in the, in the Netherlands. And this is also very clear. I was at a, a dinner hosted by the U.S. Embassy in, in Utrecht, and actually, yeah, uh, Professor Ho was up there also. And it's very clear, the table there, talking about how much interest there was uh, in the Netherlands for these elections. And of course, the big reason that Paul's already mentioned is Trump, and would he be the kingmaker? Would his um, MAGA Trumpian isolations, and we had a discussion on what isolation means in this in this regard. Would they win? Because many of the candidates in the primary selection series really were Trump candidates, um, and so that's really a concern of what would that mean if they would win? What does that can mean for America? and American democracy. I was part of a John Adams Institute uh, discussion on the 10th of um, November, right after elections, that was really focused on democracy. What does the, what do these elections mean for democracy? But also foreign po for foreign policy. And I think that uh, leading up the summer and leading up in, into October, there really was quite a roller coaster of what would happen with the election results. Uh, and it looked like there were, there were three things that really helped the Democrats. Um, namely, the, this, all the evidence that was really coming to fore of all the crimes that, that Trump had committed and with the, the, um, the different indictments that he had, also the January 6th committee, and also the things that were found at Mar-a-Lago. All these things were gaining some traction in America and how American public feels about that, felt about that. But also, um, the Democrats, Joe Biden, seemed to suddenly be able to pass legislation that was linked to his campaign promises, like the student loan forgiveness, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which also included um, a lot of money for climate uh, change, as much as $369 billion. And then, of course, which is relevant to the Dutch, and that's the CHIPS Act. He also delivered on that promise to stimulate supply side of the semiconductor industry within America. And this also has relevance for a chip industry and, and ASML here in, in the Netherlands. And the last is had to do with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the incentivization that gave to the American, especially uh, females within America. And I think, ironically, the fact that um, Dobbs versus Jackson was successful, it really took a key rallying point for the Republican Party off the table. They couldn't incentivize their voters to go and overturn Roe or over to do something about abortion because now they had achieved that and they had to go on to more divisive things like um, same-sex marriage or other, other more cultural issues that, are, that were to, to bring people out to vote. So, but I think October was sort of a whipsaw movement. You had the, the Democrats looking very good, but then you had four decade high inflation, which really then put in a very stark relief, I think, the, the unpopularity that Joe Biden has across the American electorate. And I think also, from a foreign policy point of view, what he tried to do against that when he went to the Persian Gulf and met with MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, all that was a failure and I think also <clears throat> pointed to, let's say, the Democrats were not a good uh, party for foreign policy. But of course, we know the results of the, of the midterm. But what do, what do all these things mean for foreign policy? I'll say a bit more about that. And also, I think, uh, in particular, Ukraine. Uh, and I do think that it, uh, it is quite, um, historic that Biden really did decide to lead an inter international coalition to support Ukraine. And I think in taking this leadership mantle, Biden prevailed over isolationist tendency or neo-isolationist tendencies, re uh, restrainers, we used that word a little bit in the, uh, earlier today, this sentiment in his own party. And this also became out in very stark relief with uh, this this letter that came out in October, um, 30 members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus uh, wrote a letter that wanted to will have uh, less, um, to quickly move her peace in Ukraine or to have less support for, you, for Ukraine. Um, and I think that the U.S. has played a key driving role uh, having to a unified response to Putin's aggression. I think he's been very good at holding the countries of NATO together. Uh, also to send military aid for Ukraine. I think that that's very clear what happened also with Germany, what it's recently done in its uh, de air defense missile systems, and also the Netherlands, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you because you'll be very aware of the, of the air defense uh, missiles that you have sort of, uh, supplied for Ukraine. But I think that, uh, we, Paul mentioned China, I think that Xi Jinping and Putin together with their no limits partnership that they put together accomplished 
the impossible in Washington, and that was to get bipartisan support for Ukraine. Um, I think that both parties realize that Ukraine is, is an issue that's too important to be subjected to as a wedge issue, as a, as a polarization issue for politicization, for electoral gain. I really think there's a lot of abortionists that way too, that it really are, they really are issues that can be used to gain um, some sort of electoral advantage to trigger different parts of the electorate. So I think that Ukraine was an issue that was not that way, that, that they was not subjected to that. And also I think that Ukraine, and maybe this goes a little bit against what you said, I think Ukraine has a very, very good uh, broad public support in America, although I also think that is waning as the war continues. Both houses in Congress exhibited very strong support for Ukraine um, uh, in the midterms. I think then would say you would say that will not affect foreign policy because of this broad support for Ukraine. And I also think that there were attempts by Russia and China to, to have social media influence operations uh, leading up to America. And even though they were there, I do also think that most Americans do not believe that Russia will win the war in Ukraine. And that also has an impact of what their view is for American foreign policy. I also think that America's adversaries, if we can call them that, and or critics of America do not expect that the US foreign strategy towards Ukraine will change dramatically, uh, that it won't shift, even if, if, if Republicans captured, would have captured both the Senate and the House. Um, and I think that this is clear when um, Putin met with Xi Jinping and Modi at the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. They made it clear to him that they were losing patience with him. China especially is unhappy with this, a more a united, a more militarized, a more suspicious west of China's, um, uh, its intentions at the global stage. And I think that's also very clear in the October meeting that they had, the EU 27 ministers that gathered in Luxembourg. And they very clearly said in the statement that China is an official, not only a competitor, a strategic competitor, but a tough competitor. But I do want to end my remarks now on, on the, the problems of Ukraine fatigue. I think that's a very real problem. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't shed our concerns about Trump Republicans, that, that some of them that did do well in 2022, or that will maybe do well in 2024 because Trump's brand of transactional foreign policy would indeed, as Paul mentioned, fray transatlantic ties. I think it would undermine collective security. And I think that um, Trump's previous eroding of ties across the Atlantic definitely contributed to Putin's calculations that the US would not support Europe when he attacked Ukraine. Um, so I think if we had a return to political divisions over what sort of relationship Europe thought it should build with Russia, this would bolster Putin's use of pipeline politics and his calculations that he could ride out the Western sanctions and wait for Ukraine fatigue to set in as houses get cold or gas prices get high. But I do think that um, this uh, anti-Ukraine campaign sloganeering was made by members of, the, of Trump supporters, or Trump ca campaign, um, uh, the, the ones he supported, and also in particular the House Freedom Caucus. Uh, the House Freedom Caucus represents most, some of the most extreme right-wing members of the Republican Party. Um, and what is now a razor-thin majority, I think the last I looked, it's 220 uh, in the House of uh, Republicans have over the, of the Democrats. I think many, every one of these Freedom Caucus members, especially Jim Jordan, who I think has been already quite vocal, they will have the potential to play the role that Joe Manchin did or Kristen Sinema did um, in, the, in the Senate, and they can hold legislation hostage, they can hold the entire um, the, the House hostage to their narrow agendas. And I think we could add to these potentials for paralysis the fact that the most likely House Majority Leader, that's Kevin McCarthy, he echoed anti-Ukrainian sentiments during the midterm campaign. And I think a lot of this had to do with opinion polls that came out in October that I already mentioned, this whipsaw uh, time, this roller coaster time, because at that time, this said 32 Republicans, 32% of Republicans believe that the United States has responsibility to protect and defend Ukraine from Russia, but 58% of Democrats do. So you can see there is a Ukraine fatigue taking place in the Republican Party, and I'm sure that Kevin McCarthy and others were, were trying to get some leverage out of that or trying to capitalize from that. 
But I also think there's some Ukraine fatigue here in Europe and in the Netherlands. I was uh, in Klingendal giving a lecture in October, and I was very surprised when somebody asked me about why does America care about uh, defending Ukraine. And I think that if there are isolationist voices or uh, concerns about that here in a very Atlantis uh, state, I think that we have, we have, it's no meaningless exercise. And because now you have the loudest, loudest legislatures, let's say, within Congress who could be echoing this um, reticence to help Ukraine, then I think it could be, if they, are, they continue to have success, we could see that there would be a, a, a narrowing of the pathway to help Ukraine. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hein. And um, finally, then the floor to Mr. Verhul for his comments, please. Thank you for the invitation to give my uh, comments on the current developments in the United States. Uh, I speak as a cultural historian, uh, so I have a long-term perspective and I look at the cultural dimensions, especially of foreign relations. Uh, I have a chair at um, Radboud University in Nijmegen uh, on behalf of the Netherlands Atlantic Association, especially to focus on, on that element. Uh, if I look at the midterm elections, from that cultural perspective, I see a cultural war, a cultural civil war going on within the United States. As we all know, there's growing polarization between the Republicans and the Democrats, on, uh, mainly on lines of identity. Uh, in the United States, you can predict what somebody will vote. If you ask a few questions about identity, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, education, and that will give you a fair um, indication of where somebody is. That's different from what we are used to in the Netherlands and in, um, in, in the European politics, where you fill out a Kiesweiser, <laughs> uh, which is based on issues rather than on identity. Uh, so I, I think we have to be aware that the political system works differently in the United States. Uh, also, within the United States, those parties have shifted dramatically. It's like a big tent in a large political landscape, and those tents are moving. Um, for instance, the Democrats are now have turned into a party of the highly educated, wealthy, and urban population. It's a sort of a D66 position within the United States. Uh, that's not the position they had. So it was f far more um, a, a labor uh, party identity. And similarly, the uh, Republicans are now a party of the lower educated, lower income groups in the rural areas. So it's more like a PVV uh, identity. And I, th I think it's interesting to see how in the past decades uh, those parties have shifted. Um, and also that leads to an, um, a degree of unpredictability. Also, the parties are, uh, have weak party, or, uh, weak party organizations, so there are many currents within the party. So it's, it's not sufficient to say, hey, the Republicans are there, the Democrats are there. You have to look carefully, as the previous speakers have done, at individual, um, let's say, caucuses within the parties. Um, also, we should be aware that the most voters are not a member of either party, but are independents. So uh, there, there is a, a large group of voters who make last minute decisions. So that all leads to a unpredictable political climate. If I look from that perspective at the midterm elections, I see that, um, and the previous speakers agree with me, that there is a large consensus on the major geopolitical issues. So if you look, look at Russia, and Ukraine and China and Taiwan, uh, I, I think we, we, we can agree that uh, the majority of um, uh, political parties and, um, uh, support a, what, what is called a managed competition with those two authoritarian uh, competitors of the United States and of the Western world. Similarly with uh, Iran, Iran and the um, um, nuclear um, uh, non-proliferation -prol and uh, fortunately also NATO uh, has support. So th that's not where the big shifts are. The big shifts are, I think, and the problems ahead are in the field of what I call globalization topics. Uh, and then we should be thinking about climate, health, COVID, uh, migration, uh, trade, technology, 
Uh, th those are all fields where the political parties are extremely divided. Uh, and now the House uh, will move to the Republicans. It will be very hard for the United States to pass legislation in any of those areas, and especially climate. You already said it. I, I think it's a concern, uh, especially for, for Europe and the Netherlands. Uh, if you look at the long term, uh, there is an important shift within both parties visible in the field of foreign policy. The Republican Party traditionally was a party of re realistic interventionism, was engaging in the world with uh, a concept of power. Think of Reagan and the Cold War and the way he ended the Cold War uh, with, with enga uh, by engaging with the world. Uh, and we now see that within the Republican Party, there's a strong wing that is more isolationist of, or at least bilateral um, and is discarding that uh, uh, responsibility that the United States has felt for the fate of the world. It's now America first, uh, and if not America first, it's, as, uh, uh, um, it's econ uh, an economy-driven unilateral approach that we see within the Republican Party. But more surprising, I think, uh, and noteworthy, is that within the Democrats there is also a very important shift going on. Uh, the Democrats were traditionally an idealist, interventionist uh, party, uh, symbolized by, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the liberal world order uh, that he helped us to build. But now, uh, under Biden, who sees, who positions himself as a uh, FDR 2.0, we see that there is already a shift towards a what he calls a foreign policy for the middle classes. That means that interest and realism and trade are important issues now at, in the current administration, and we have to be very careful um, to be aware of that, I think, in the Netherlands, because we, we have very important trade uh, and economic relations with the United States, and there is a shift from that, uh, let's say, global idealism to a economic realism. Um, and that's going on, and there's... There is some discussion in the academic field whether this is an incident and whether Biden will be succeeded by a Democrat who will return to the, uh, let's say, the, the liberal world order posture, uh, but that's uncertain. Um, this election was not about foreign relations, let's be sure about that, but it will have repercussions for foreign relations. Uh, first of all, there is a power shift going on within the Republican Party. Uh, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell was always the, <coughs> the voice of, the, let's say, the more traditional Republican foreign policy perspective. We now see that in the House, at least, Kevin McCarthy and uh, most of all Marjorie, Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene are becoming prominent, uh, and they are uh, Trumpist election deniers. So at least they move uh, uh, the Republican Party in a different direction. Some people in the Netherlands um, uh, said that they were relieved about the midterm elections. I would like to point out that, uh, according to the Washington Post, 178 election deniers have won the elections in the Senate, the House, and the statewide offices. Uh, and uh, this morning, the New York Times calculated that 220 skeptics, skeptics and deniers won. So th there is a large shift going on that's not immediately uh, visible. Um, and lastly, of course, this election uh, is a foreshadowing of what will happen in 2024. Uh, and the prediction, a prediction is now that Ron DeSantis could be the front runner for the Republicans. Um, uh, whether he will win from Biden or Biden 2.0, nobody knows. But the Santos is interesting because uh, in the foreign policy analysis um, of, of his position, uh, Europe doesn't play a very important role at all. Um, his focus is very much on globalization issues, uh, on Cuba, on immigration, and on, to, uh, on let's say, anti-globalization. I would like to end with a warning, and that's that um, whatever will happen in the next two years, um, uh, the Netherlands and Europe cannot no longer count um, on the US um, support. We cannot take that for granted anymore. So we, we have to uh, think 
and rethink our position on three important fields, I think. First of all, the principles of the liberal world order, democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and freedom are not um, values that are only supported by the United States. They should be values that are supported by us here in the Netherlands and by Europe. Uh, and we should make that um, clear and visible. Uh, and we should not be dependent on the support of the United States for that. The liberal or world order, yes, was created by FDR, but it's now our order, and I think we should own it. Secondly, I think collective defense uh, is a growing concern, especially the relation between NATO on the one hand and the EU, and the EU defense identity, as it's euphemistically called now, uh, is, a, is a source of concern, the demarcation between the two organizations is uh, uh, a uh, constant um, a debate going on. Also in the, in the last NATO uh, strategic concept, <coughs> there is an interesting paragraph about that where the EU is described as a partner, which is interesting because there is also an overlap. It's almost as if the EU is out there. Uh, I, I think that should um, give us source of concern. And then lastly, there are all those globalization issues. I think we should own as well climate, COVID, migration, uh, and, and the way we deal with that <coughs> is not something that we should leave to the United States. Uh, in concluding, uh, I think we should not be saying goodbye to the United States. Uh, quite on the contrary, we should not be looking at a post-American Europe, as somebody predicted uh, not long ago. But uh, I, I think we should become a more equal and therefore more sustainable partner of the United States. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Verheul. Then we will now go to the uh, side of the members of parliament uh, and their questions. Um, I suggest that um, each of you asks uh, two questions. If possible, indicate who you would like to answer. Um, and after the questions were asked by the first uh, member of parliament, I would like to ask for an answer immediately, and then we go to the second uh, member of parliament, and if time av is available, I will also add some questions. Mr. van der Lee. Thanks, uh, Chair, and also th thanks very much for your introductions. Um, interesting to hear. So uh, I think we can all agree that the world is in turmoil, and uh, we see a lot of roller coasters everywhere. So, uh, so my first question would be, uh, given the analysis you have uh, yeah, just uh, presented, uh, is it just a, a, a moment in time that was uh, more fortunate for the Democratic Party than uh, previously expected? Or are there also some more structural uh, changes going on? And I, I mean more in the demographic uh, development of the United States that could favor one of the two uh, parties. Uh, yeah. I think one of the, uh, <coughs> the facts is that uh, especially younger people uh, came uh, to the ballot more than uh, usually. Is that an incident or is that uh, maybe a trend? Uh, so I would like to hear yeah, maybe from um, Mrs. Haar if she could elaborate a bit uh, on that issue. Uh, what are the, the more structural uh, shifts? And the second question, should I Post it immediately. Uh, it's, I think, related to um, the cultural war, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for, as, as you call it. Uh, it has already been going on for quite a while now. Um, and if you relate that to the to, to foreign uh, policy, uh, you, see, you mentioned the consensus on, on the, the big geopolitical uh, questions in relationship to China and Russia. Uh, but what, what are the, the, the issues that could be uh, a vocal point in the cultural war uh, in the next uh, two years towards the next presidential elections? Uh, and maybe that uh, uh, Mr. Verhul can, can explain that. Thank you, Mr. van der Lee. Mrs. Haar, could you respond? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I, I have a little disagreement with some of my, my fellow panelists here, and I, I thought we might talk about this, so I brought this. It's, after the elections, I gave several presentations about explaining to, American, explaining to Dutch audiences why Trump was elected. 
And I think this, this map I have here is a very good explanation of why that he's elected. And this map is a county map of all the counties in the United States. And it's a map not based on so size, but size that they contribute to the overall economy. And you'll see that there are um, 500 counties that voted for Biden. But these 500 counties represent 70% of America's GDP. But there were 2,400 counties that voted for Trump. And of course, they then represented 29% of the GDP. And I think that's, that's the real problem in America, is there is a big part of America that feels left behind, that feels that the coastal elites, <coughs> and I come from that part of America, I come from South Dakota, and when I go home, you see that the main streets in there are crumbling, and that people feel like somehow they're left behind, and they want to have jobs with dignity, and they feel that globalization may be benefiting, well, all of America, but the, the cost or the the pain of globalization is felt very much in the Rust Belts. And, and many of these counties are in those swing states that voted for Trump. And there's another number that Democrats don't like to hear, and that's 9 million. There are 9 million Americans who voted for Obama in 2012, and then they voted for Trump in 2016. And that's very clear that they're part of this group of people who feel that they are structurally left behind. I think that's the real key to it. Indeed, there are more, I mean, in the last election, the presidential election, more Americans voted than ever. And certainly in the midterms, the last time when Trump was president, that was the highest midterms ever, because people were very upset about, let's say, the attack on democracy or the way that Trump was president, because he, wasn't, he doesn't care about policies. He cares about Trump. But nevertheless, there are all these 74 million voters who are still backing him. That's why you have 220 deniers, because they're still, I mean, the Republican Party, Paul said that's in bad shape. But it's not in bad shape if you are, if you're, want to capture power. If you have 74 million voters who are willing to come out to vote for you, the chances of reclaiming power are pretty good. So you have to be the other side that has to then um, trigger or be meaningful to also capture the vote, to bring the other people to vote. And whether that's Roe versus Wade or guns, because most Americans want to have gun control laws. Most Americans want to have a right to, to make a decision about your own body, whether to have an abortion or not. But that it's still captured by the fragmented system of America means it's also captured by more special interests. So I think, do you, I don't know if that's quite the answer that you were expecting, but I think structurally America is, is a Pain, a, a part of the society is feeling economic pain. And actually, I think that Joe Biden realizes that because some of the things he's trying to do and the things that are actually controversial with Europe, and I don't know if I completely agree about that America will no longer need, you can't look to America for support anymore. I think that's, I have to say, I disagree with you. I think the, the support that America's given Ukraine certainly shows that it is very willing to be out there leading globally at an international structure. But economically, it definitely wants, it, Biden is changing tack. He definitely wants to say, we're going to invest in America. And we're doing that because we see the big challenge on the, on the stage is China. And we have to invest in all those people who don't have jobs, those people who didn't vote for him. We're going to re, restart America. And that's how he's doing. And of course, but that's in direct conflict with the partners you have for your, your global economy. And that's Europe. And that's why you see that Macron and Schultz, although they may not get along with each other very well, they certainly agree on that the US is, protect, is practicing protectionism, and they will be taken to the WTO. So I think the things that America is doing to try to address this problem will be maybe the future fraught relations that you have, and that will be in the economic realm, but not in the, the support for democracies or support for security. OK. Thank you. Mr. Verhul. Thank you for that question. Indeed, uh, the cultural civil war has been going on for a while. It started, I think, in the mid-1960s with the civil rights legislation and with the, um, the, uh, the emergence of identity politics and uh, with what uh, the Dutch intellectual Hofland once called the decolonization of the citizen. That, that's, of course, what the uh, large revolution of the 1960s um, delivered. 
Uh, and that's, I fully agree with the previous speaker, <laughs> Professor Haar, that's what the uh, current right-wing conservatives are fighting against. There's a sense of loss of a society that they felt they knew, and all of a sudden is uh, unmoored and uh, unhinged. Um, but uh, yes, it's going on, but the political translation is now um, uh, leading to a growing polarization. There is there's interesting statistical research to the way the, uh, the, the parties are drifting apart uh, and the, the disappearance of um, uh, 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 bilateral uh, <laughs> coalitions between the, the two parties, that's disappearing. I, th I think that's the change now, that uh, the, the parties are moving um, further apart from each other, and it's very difficult to, f to find common ground anymore. Um, the, the question, your, que your question was how that translates into um, uh, foreign policy issues that are, will get more complicated. And then my answer is, again, that the, the globalization issues uh, will be most difficult to, to tackle. And that's uh, climate and, uh, and, and, uh, and the energy transition and the way we <coughs> Uh, work transatlantically to work with that, but also trade. Uh, free trade uh, is, uh, was one of the centers of the liberal world or order. It's no longer a given. And I think that's um, a field where we uh, should ne negotiate. But I, th I think another um, a victim, let's say, of that cultural civil war is that we now live in a post-truth society for many Americans and that we also have to um, renegotiate the, the basic facts from which we argue, and especially in the field of climate. That's now, I, th I think, a worrying uh, development in the United States that we cannot agree uh, anymore, at least with a party, uh, no, a part of the uh, conservative uh, 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 right uh, about what the, um, what the facts are that we are working with. That would be me, my answer. Mr. Van Hoff, you would like to comment as well. Yes, yeah, just, uh, just very, very briefly. Um, so I do. Th is the Republican Party in bad shape? Not in terms of can it win elections and get votes, but in terms of having a coherent policy program. I don't see it having that at the point at this point. And when it comes to those those districts, I, I think that that is correct. There's a there's an urban the urban rural divide. There's a uh, coast versus the, the, the middle divide and the south divide. That all being said, if, when the question was, what, well, you know, will the long-term demographic change essentially help the Democratic Party, um, this election, so young people don't, be, young Americans don't really go out to vote. It might have been simply the accumulation of the, the loss of abortion rights, the <coughs> attack on gay rights, just enough, enough big kind of pushes to get just enough voters in there. Um, so I'm not sure you know, if that's necessarily is an optimistic story from a perspective of if you'd want to see the Democrats win, if this really shows a very optimistic story. Um, with these cultural uh, cleavage issues, that is still primarily works in the, to the benefit of the, the hardliners on the Republican Party. So in that sense, the Republican Party is kind of held hostage by, its, by the, the far ends of it. And also when it comes to certain other kind of demographic changes, it, there's also interesting like subtrends where you can see shifts in, for example, in the, in the Latino demography that have actually moved to, the, you know, still predominantly supporting Democrats, but also in, for, especially in key districts, especially in Florida, kind of moving to, towards the Republican Party. So it's, it's a, it, and finally, if you just look at the, the supporters uh, support for Trump, a lot of them were actually quite wealthy, right? People went to the January 6 protest with their private jet. You had, you know, you had people with, you know, higher educated, uh, you know, you had the dentists, lawyers, you had people who owned businesses. I mean, there's a bit of a cliche, a bit of a classist, I think, cliche that everybody who supports Trump is somewhat, you know, backwards and, and a hillbilly or something like that. But that's not, clearly not the case. It really draws a lot of support, as it does as populist movements all over the world do, they draw a lot of support from also the professional classes. So just to nuance that, that, that point a little bit. 
Thank you very much. Then I would like to hear the questions from Mr. Brickelmans, please. Yes, thank you very much for your, uh, your introduction and also your very clear uh, answers. Um, actually, I would like to ask a quick question to, uh, to each of you, uh, if, if that's okay, uh, very quick. Um, one, one is about um, uh, the Republican Party to, uh, to Ms. Haar. Um, I think from the midterm election results, you could draw two conclusions. Either you could say the Republicans lost because uh, Trump's popularity is over, and you see that many of his candidates uh, kind of lost. Maybe uh, Trump and Trump uh, supporters would say we lost because Trump was not in the race, and Trump is the only one that can truly win an election, and in the end, as a, a maybe as a comeback candidate, can uh, um, can win um, uh, can win against the Democrats. Um, wh wh what do you think? What sentiment will prevail? And do you think that Trump is kind of out of the game, or that there is still a lot? enough support for him to make a, a true comeback. Um, I would like to ask a question to uh, Mr. Verhul about uh, support to Ukraine, because Ms. Haar, I think, rightly said that you see that there are, um, especially on the Republican side, but also on the, the left side of the Democrats, that support for Ukraine is kind of uh, decreasing. Um, we were in uh, the United States, uh, we were visiting in May, and then there was still very broad support. And on both sides, uh, people were saying, um, for the United States, it is a, it's actually quite clear that there is a very, um, there were many reasons why there was so much support for Ukraine, but a few of them were one, um, it, it's, it's a very clear case of good versus bad, or good versus evil. Um, it's different than in Afghanistan and Iraq, which was much more complicated. And second, that the United States could play a leading role, both in terms of intelligence and delivery of weapons. Um, so my question is, do you think that the decrease in support for Ukraine could really reach a turning point where there is indeed a majority not supporting more weapon delivery and, and uh, maintaining sanctions or is it more like in the Netherlands that maybe on the, the far sides there could be a decrease in support, but there's still a big overall majority um, uh, which will maintain support? Um, and then uh, finally um, uh, to uh, Mr. Van Hooft. Um, I think uh, one of the speakers said that, um, uh, that, that we cannot count on the support of the United States. Uh, and what I'm... Uh, try to figure out is what can we do in order to, um, um, uh, regardless of, of which uh, party will, 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 is going to be in the White House, but how can we maximize the chances that there will be U.S. support uh, to Europe? And of course, as you mentioned, uh, the, the rivalry with China is the, the biggest concern for the United States. Do you think it's important for Europe to simply choose sides? to say, OK, we uh, will we'll support the United States, whether there will be uh, technological sanctions like we have seen recently. Um, because it, do you see the risk that if we do not choose sides, then the United States will say, OK, Europe wants to keep its independent uh, position. Uh, but then, OK, we, we are not, uh, the partnership is not as strong as in the past. Um, do you think this, if, if, we, if that's our, our strategy, that, that might harm our relationship with the United States in the long term? Thank you, Mr. Brekelmans. Um, let's take the same order of the questions. Mrs. Haar, Mrs. Haar, yes, please. Thank you very much for your question. I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I'll give you some good uh, guesstimates in what I think. First of all, and this also goes on with Paul said, clearly the elites or the professionals of the Republican Party do not like Trump. They haven't liked him from the beginning. They have tried to jettison him in the, in the primary process, they do not like him. He is not a Republican in the traditional sense of the Republicans, as has already been mentioned. But there have been, maybe you remember Billy Gate, when Trump said some very horrendous things about what he could do with women and get away with it. After he said that, my senator from South Dakota, John Thune, who is the minority whip, that means he's second in command in the Senate after Mitch McConnell, he said, we should have a write-in candidate. We should not have, this man does not have the, the integrity or he has a value system if we want to be our president. Didn't stand for long. He, st he still ran. He still became the president. Then you had, of course, the midterms when he was president. Clearly lost. There was a blue wave. 
people thought, yes, we need to have a different person on the ticket when it comes around again. Didn't happen. Then you have January 6th, when Kevin McCarthy, the to be soon minority, majority leader, called him up and said, my family is in danger. We're here in the, in the Capitol, and we are going to be attacked. Do something. And response that Trump gave was, well, they clearly care more about the election than you do, Kevin. So Kevin McCarthy also said Trump should not be the candidate or should not be the person in our party. But then not long after that, McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago and almost like, a, like kissing his finger. So I don't know. There's been indeed three now losses. But he's lost and he's tried the patience of the professionals in the party several times. But, it, when, but if the base of the Republican Party want him, you will say all kinds of things and contort your arguments in all kinds of ways. And I think we mentioned DeSantis. Now, DeSantis is in office or was elected last time because he was so very obviously connected to Trump. It would be very hard for him to come out now and have some sort of you know, regicide, let's call it that way and still go ahead. That'll be extremely hard for him. And it's very interesting that Trump, even though he, the Republican Party didn't want him to, announce his candidacy before the Georgia runoff. So that's interesting that he doesn't care about, the, Trump does not care about the professionals in the Republican Party. So I think it'll be very hard for DeSantis, now that he's out there, to say, now I'm going to run against Trump. And Trump is positioning himself. And he'll be little people. He's very good at being a bully on stage or catching people's weaknesses and making them look somehow small. So those are all things that have happened in the past. And you have to look to the future about knowing what happened in the past. So I don't know. But those are the things I do know. Thank you. Second question was for Mr. Verhul, right? Mr. Verhul. Yeah, that, that's a very uh, good and difficult question uh, for me as a historian to do uh, predictions about what will happen to the support uh, to the war for Ukraine. I, I see that indeed there is a fatigue uh, in both parties. Uh, as Professor Haar said, uh, 30 members of the Democrats uh, wrote a letter to Biden saying that um, he should uh, start negotiating with Russia and that the boycott should, uh, should stop simply because of the economic uh, damage that it would do to their voters uh, and to the United States. How, however, the letter was never sent, or it was sent and then uh, uh, withdrawn, uh, the, the 30 members said that it was a mistake, but still uh, I see that as a, as a signal that there is uh, uh, an erosion. And also on the Republican side, um, uh, 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 Kevin McCarthy and uh, uh, Majority Green and uh, other members have said that um, the focus should no longer be on, or at least that there should not be a blank check to uh, Ukraine and that the focus should be on the economic interests of the, uh, of the United States. So, yeah, yes, it's possible that at the end there will be uh, pressure from the United States on the government of Ukraine to start negotiations. But that's, that moment has not arrived yet. So I, it's very difficult to say. But, yes, I, I see in, in both parties that uh, questions are being asked. Uh, how, however, and I agree with... <laughs> Uh, with uh, the, the first speaker that I agree that um, uh, nobody in the United States would want Russia to win this. Uh, it's inconceivable that the United States would, uh, at this point, I think, uh, withdraw from that struggle. But, but the solution could be a sort of a negotiation uh, and, and a sort of a midway. But I, I don't see that happening at the moment. Mr. Van Hoofd. Yes, um, I think that's a, that's a, that's an excellent, that's an important question. What do we need to do to engage the U.S.? Um, so yes, we should do things to engage the U.S. However, we have to also take a step back and first acknowledge that with, with, with <coughs> the extent to which the U.S. wants to stay in Europe and be engaged in European affairs is primarily shaped by what the U.S. thinks, you know, U.S. officials, U.S. leadership thinks is important. It is only to some extent shaped by the signals we send. Right? I, um, if you look at the just post-Cold War, um, what was the whole argument about NATO enlargement, uh, uh, proceeding or 
going together with NATO enlargement that NATO should change its mission, it should go out of area or it would go out of business, the U.S. would no longer care. Yet at the same time, when Europeans followed the U.S. to Afghanistan, to, to Iraq, it actually paid off very little, right? Those were, you know, in absolute sense, for most, of, for most European countries, pretty small contributions. But in a relative sense to, you know, to, to smaller countries, these, are, these were massive contributions and very difficult and very painful you know, to, to, to explain to the public. And what did it actually get Europeans? If you, if you look at the Iraq war, what did, it, what did Blair and the UK get for having near, near to, as, I mean, you can't support the, the US more than the British did at that point in time. And I was struck when I was uh, when I when I when I was in the U.S. and I, 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 you know, as a researcher, and I would interview all these officials, and you would ask them, and then they would be. This was you know, 2013, 16, 18, 19, 20. Um, and they would be very criti critical of the British. It was like, well, yeah, but now they can't do anything anymore. Now we prefer the French. You know, it was very, even not with you know, not with the so-called transactional Trump. Uh, officials, but with everyone, that was just you know what have you done for me lately? And for the UK, that I think broke their armed forces for a good ten years. Um, so there is just a real risk. I think there's a risk in seeing this in a too simple a manner. Is in we'll show up, and then the then this will translate all the way into U.S. thinking. Right? It, it will mean something in that specific department of the of their Department of Defense. You know, they they'll have good memories and go yes, you know. We could work really well with the Danish and the Dutch, and uh, with good experiences with the British here and with the French there. That, th what does that mean when it goes to to Congress? Very little, right? It's very much on the margins, and you can even tell how off, how little awareness there is of who is actually contributed to which military missions and so on. That all being said, I do think we really need to re-engage the transatlantic relationship, but we need to do this as a much more long-term effort less of a simple, you know, show the flag and then kind of hope that we're fine for the next few years. And I think that is much more in the direction which you already signaled, which is on economic statecraft. Um, that might mean, because that is also, if you think of Europe or the EU as a whole, that is probably the most powerful geopolitical tool we have. Access to the markets, our ability to set, to set standards, right? all, all these other things. And you can see actually the, the model working really well with the Russia sanctions, right? That was quite powerful. Um, I think that is something to really communicate to U.S. administrations because the transatlantic relationship for it to work also should be accompanied with a, a change of mindset in, in Washington where it sees us more as an actual partner, which it doesn't, right? It has, the U.S. has mostly bilateral relationships. That's not a, a, an artifact of the Trump era. Trump just said it out loud. If you go back the last 30 years, every time there seems to be a bit of pushback from key European states, then there are bilateral missions that target specific, you know, smaller countries to kind of vote, uh, to vote against whatever the, the U.S. doesn't want to happen. So I think the economic statecraft is a, is a part of it, and that will mean something like choosing sides between the U.S. and China. And I think that might already be a bridge that has already been burned. But even by doing that, there's still a lot, I think, of room to maneuver in there. Um, and to kind of also not just to to essentially to dampen China, but to really use it access to European markets as kind of a positive inducement, right? That is the same signal that also needs to be sent to Washington, right? because what we see now is that we've gone from one extreme, you know, the era of globalization, you know, everything is a positive, everybody wins all the time, to now essentially only negative statecraft. From economic statecraft from the U from the U.S., right? It's just sanctions. It's just export controls. It's just the sense that we all have to fall in line really quickly. I'm not sure if the the U.S. is helping itself. I was last week. I was in South Korea, and this is South Korea is about as close an ally of the U.S. as you can imagine. And there's just deep, deep frustration, right? This is really going to hurt them economically. You know, what, where, to whom ASML can sell is also going to hurt us economically, right? So what I'm saying is the answer of how do we keep the transatlantic relationship going is also to put it on a more balanced footing because this, this whole sense of let's just do a little bit and then we'll just you know, kick the ball forward for another five years, 
and you know, we'll hopefully we'll get you know a, a nice president the next time again or not. You know, it, it, that is not that is not policy. That's not strategy on our part. We should really do this as a, in a much more comprehensive way, using our market power, um, and also that has both directed at China, but also directed at the U.S. itself. Mrs. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I would give the. If you ask me that question from a U.S. perspective, what do you need to have that part of the transatlantic relationship? Because I think Paul did a very good job of thinking about what you might expect from that, and I think the the whole ASML thing is going to be very interesting in the near future. But I, I wrote down two things that Americans would say. First one is have a strategy for Asia, have a strategy for China that is aligned with what America have have a role to play in Asia because that's where America is looking. Whatever the national security strategy just came out um, at the beginning in October, and it and it was supposed to come out in February, but it didn't come out in February because we had something else that happened in February. So they kept it for for eight months or whatever, and, and five months, and rewrote it, and to include Russia because the first one only was about China. America's only looking and thinking about China. So if you want to have something to do with America and strengthen that relationship, they will want you to come aboard. That's it. The second thing that I wrote down was. Support Ukraine in, in really meaningful ways. I, I did, some, did a search of what the, the, the current um, commitments are to Ukraine. And the US, as of October 3rd, what they've already committed is $52 billion. And in the, in the lame duck period, they probably are trying to get another 30 that's, that's actually going out the door. And EU, compared to that, is 16. And then the other countries that have in the billions is United Kingdom 6.6, .6, but you said it broke it, maybe? No, no, or, or, or something else. Okay. Or Germany's three, Canada three, Poland nearly three. But then you get down to the Netherlands, it's also 500 million. So if, I mean, if this is what America is also thinking about. We have this, this adversary that we need to, at least if not make sure we win with Ukraine, at least we get to some place that, that they're not, the grains aren't losing. And to get to that place, we're going to need to have Ukraine has, has more support. So America's thinking that. I know Biden administration is thinking about that. And if you want to have something to build trans relations, the Americans will say, come aboard. Well, thank you, Mrs. Hay, for your additional comment. That gives a different perspective. Um, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the time that we have for this meeting. Um, I would like to thank all three of our guests very much. You brought forward points of view that help us structure our ideas and views on this issue. And uh, then I would like to wrap up the meeting. Thank you very much.